My name is Matt Allen. I'm the field director at the ACLU of Massachusetts. And I'll be the main individual who's going to be following up with you after this webinar um, to stay in touch and to make sure you're able to get involved with this campaign. We have several uh, other presenters tonight. So I am just going to take a moment to introduce them one by one. And then we'll get started. So uh, if you can start with introductions from Valeria. I'm Valeria. Hi, I'm the lead coordinator at the Student Immigrant Movement. Lena, could you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Lena Papayanis. I'm a teacher in Boston Public Schools. I'm also one of the leaders of Unafraid Educators, which is the Immigrant Rights Organizing Committee of the Boston Teachers Union. Thank you. Nora? Hi, I'm Nora Paul Schultz. I'm also a teacher in Boston Public Schools and also one of the co-chairs of Unafraid Educators. And uh, Fatima, I realize you just joined. You might not be able to access. Oh, okay. <laughs> Figure it out. Great. Can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah. Hi, I'm Fatima Ahmed. I am executive director at the Muslim Justice League. And Emiliano. Hi, how are you? My name is Emiliano Falcon. I'm policy counsel of the Tech for Liberty program at the ACLU of Massachusetts. Nice to see you all virtually, kind of. <laughs> With that being said, let's move to the presentation. So I just want to start off by giving a little insight into the Boston City Council. This is the body that is going to be making decisions on the um, uh, two ordinances that we're going to be talking about today. As you can see, there are uh, 13 city councilors. And what I just want you to keep in mind is that there are four at-large city councilors. Those are the ones up top with the exception of Kim Janey, who is the city council president. Um, so when we ask you to do outreach, what we're talking about is you actually have the ability to do outreach to four councilors. All at-large councilors represent you. And then you also have one district councilor who represents your particular geography. So that's just something to keep in mind when we talk about actions uh, directed at the city council. So that being said, I'm gonna turn over to Emiliano. He's gonna talk about these policies. How are you? My name is Emiliano, I'll introduce myself. It's nice to have you all here. So first we're going to start talking about the organizations, this coalition that we build to present these two ordinances. Uh, this coalition is mainly uh, headed, uh, lead, um, the leaders of this coalition is the ACLU of Massachusetts, Student Immigrant Movement, SIM, Unafraid Educators, and the Muslim Justice League. And so far, we have more than 15 endorsers uh, of this effort that we are carrying out at the Boston City Council, which are, for example, the American Friends Service Committee, the Campaign for a Commercial Free Childhood, Charles Hamilton Houston Institute, Digital Fourth, Restore the Fourth, uh, the Boston Chapter. Fight for the Future, Jew Jewish Alliance for Law and Social Action, and Jewish Voices for Peace in Boston. Uh, these are some of the endorsers that we have and more are coming, so, so hopefully uh, we will be able to pass these ordinances. So, what are these ordinances about? Yeah. These are two ordinances. The first one is a face surveillance ban. So this is an ordinance banning the use of face surveillance by municipal government agencies in Boston, including Boston Public Schools, and Boston Police Department. The second ordinance is a surveillance and information sharing oversight. This is an ordinance requiring city council approval of all city surveillance technology and practices. And that, and that also provides for protections for the sharing of the students' information between the Boston Public, Boston Public Schools, Boston School Police, Boston Police Department, and outside agencies like ICE. So I will start explaining the face surveillance ban the main provisions, and then I'm going to start describing uh, the surveillance and information sharing oversight, and then I'm going to give way to uh, my colleagues uh, so that they can explain a little bit more about the information sharing uh, at Boston Public Schools. So here we have the face surveillance ban. As you may know, uh, we have been passing this type of bans in a lot of cities and towns here in Massachusetts. Uh, so the main provisions of this ordinance is that, first of all, it bans the city of Boston and its agencies from using both face surveillance technology and information obtained from it. As you may know, or maybe you don't know, uh, but face surveillance technology is a technology that uses our facial features to identify us everywhere we go at all time. Uh, so this is a very dangerous technology. That's why we are pushing uh, for it to be banned in the city of Boston to be used by the city of Boston and its agencies. 
the ordinance also creates exclusionary rule uh, for information collected or derived from the use of the, te of the technology so that the city of Boston, if someone violates this ordinance, then they won't be able to use this information against us. And finally, it creates a private right of action to seek enforcement so that if you are identified by this uh, type of technology and then uh, you want to seek enforcement of this ordinance, you will be able, any, any resident of Boston will be able to do it. And as, and as I mentioned uh, when I started, uh, we already passed these municipal bonds in Somerville, Brookline, Northampton, Cambridge, and Springfield. Uh, we have so far protected 440,000 Massachusetts residents. And if we pass this ordinance in Boston, we will take this number up to more than a million of residents. Second, the second ordinance is this community control over police surveillance, uh, which I mentioned before. Uh, which is a local law, also an ordinance, but this, this, this time it is not banning any kind of technology, but it requires the Boston City Council approval of all city surveillance technology and practices. Let's say, for example, that the Boston Police Department wants to acquire drones, when in that case they will have to go through a process uh, in the City Council where the community will be involved, involved where they will have to present uh, the technology present the risks to civil rights, civil liberties, and then eventually get approved or not. And then they can start using it in accordance with those policies and practices that they said they, they would. And uh, very, uh, um, a, a new thing that is on this kind of, of, of ordinances, which we passed on Cambridge and Lawrence and Somerville also has, uh, or, or the, these municipalities also have this kind of ordinances, is that in this time we're including a provision pertaining to information sharing among Boston public schools, Boston school police, and Boston police department, and between them and the federal government. This is essentially a democratic check on BPS and BPD information sharing and the sharing of, informa the sharing of information with ICE. So now I will give way to Valeria, who will explain and talk about this a little bit more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emiliano. So um, we're just going to take some time to introduce some of the organizations that have been leading this effort with the ACLU. Um, like I said before, I'm the lead coordinator at the Student Immigrant Movement, and we are the first um, in documented and immigrant youth-led, member-led grassroots organization in Massachusetts. Um, and we work on engaging with young people and just working with them on politicizing and building leadership skills. Um, and we have unafraid educators. Yeah, so unafraid educators, um, as we mentioned before, um, is actually part of the Boston Teachers Union. Um, we're one of the organizing committees of the BTU. Um, and our focus is on promoting immigrant rights um, in our district. Um, and for us, that means building sanctuary schools from the ground up um, in our schools. Um, and so we focus mostly on undocumented students and students from mixed status families. And we also have MJL with us. Um. Uh, I'm Fatma again from Muslim Justice League. We are a local, um, you know, organization that focuses on you know, folks who are deemed a national security threat or seen as, you know, some kind of threat by, um, by the state and typically over-policed and surveilled. Um, so not just Muslim folks, but, you know, people of color, activists, really anybody um, who is seen as, as a threat and over-policed because of it. Um, so it's, it's been really important for us to be, um, you know, a part of this work. We think it's really important to introduce these ordinances and really start the path of, of creating more, um, you know, control and transparency over what the Boston Police Department is doing, especially because we know that the Boston Police Department has, you know, used all sorts of technology and all sorts of practices um, to surveil local local folks. I think, you know, even a few years ago, probably, you know, people have seen the news about them using Geophedia to look at people's social media and really using terms like Black Lives Matter and a lot of um, Muslim, like really common Muslim terms to to surveil folks. So we're really excited to be, um, you know, a part of this 
this work that's really starting, um, you know, to, to create some movement here in Boston. Thanks, everyone. So I just um, copied these terms into the chat so that you have them to refer to as we continue the presentation. Um, but you probably are familiar with most of them, like BPS is Boston Public Schools and BPD. But usually the one that most folks aren't aware of is BRIC, which is the Boston Regional Intelligence Center. And it's just um, a network that uh, shares information with um, or intelligence, as they call it, with local and state and federal enforcement um so we before we so just refer back to that um whenever you need to but as we move into the next slide i just want to give a brief overview about how it is that we got into doing this work um in this way so back in 2015 um a young person a east boston student was actually deported um, due to several documentations that reached ice um, but they had originally come from both the school level and the BPD. Um, and so in 2017, the story came to light along with all of the documentation involved in that student's case, um, which included a, one of the incident reports was a stop and frisk um, that occurred in a local dog park near the school, but nothing was found, no weapons were recovered, except that the group of individuals, the young people were stopped were in fact um, determined, uh, labeled as affiliated gang members or self-identified gang members. We'll take a look in a bit about that, but another incident report was one that cited an a incident, that a fight that was unsuccessful um, and didn't really lead to anything, but still was used against the student, again, with gang allegations. So then in December of 2017, the lawyers filed um, for a public records request to obtain more information from VPS around these incident reports that were going from the school level to um, BPD and reaching ICE. Um, that, and what happened there is just that VPS took a really long time um, to, obtain, to give some of that information. And then in June of 2018, the lawyer groups went on to actually file a lawsuit um, involving Tommy Chang, who was a superintendent at the time. Now we have Brenda Casillas, um, as well as the city. The city was also involved in the lawsuit. Um, and then in fall of 2019, we actually began to work with the new superintendent, the new administration, because we already had met with the previous administration under Tommy Chang to actually try to address this issue. But given his resignment, that was that wasn't um, we were able to do that. So when we're able to start working again in 2019. We also began working with several groups and lawyer groups um, as, like the ACLU, like MJL and others to create a comprehensive policy that really got into the issue that we're talking about. And then finally, and you know, if we look in the next slide, you probably remember seeing all of these different news reports that came about, you know, talking about how BPS was sharing information with ICE. Um, and that was back in January um, of this year. So moving forward, um, I just wanted to give you some visual representation of what these incident reports look like. As you can see there, I highlighted the part that talks about how this incident report that you can clearly see at the top came from the Department of Safety Services from BPS, but was sent directly to BRIC, meaning there was no oversight that we know of. Um, and so on the right, you can see also the descriptions that I talked about, um, talking about the member, uh, the youth being a verified MS-13 gang member. So moving forward, um, I just want to ground us on, um, the, I know this looks like a lot, but it's, it's just to help us kind of ground ourselves um, on the fact that obviously there's a lot of ways for us to target power, right, um, and, and try to create change. Um, we see the learn without fear policy at the BPS level as a citywide surveillance, um, and the, oh, sorry, and the citywide surveillance ordinance um, and the face ban as the first step to a much longer and bigger march towards ending the criminalization of young people, not just you know in Boston, but also across Massachusetts and not just immigrants, but all young people. And we know that um, other regions do look at Boston as a model. And in fact, right now, this is all the evidence we have in hand to go and run with. So you know that's what we're, we're doing. We're starting to work here, but we'll definitely expand. And, um, you know, we know that whether it's in the schools or in the streets that the police does harass 
young people, families, and community members. They, they track and surveil people, just like um, you know Fatima was alluding to earlier on. So the policies we're advocating for here is definitely not the end all be all, but you know we're really working on disrupting collaboration amongst institutions. Um, and so as you can see, obviously we'll be focusing on the boxes in, in, um, in purple, which kind of uh, show the relationship uh, between the incident reports, lending and ICE, but um, in, in red circled in the orange box in red, you can see the, where we're starting with the policy changes. But obviously this could lead to other things like addressing the MOU, with, you know, the MOA between uh, the schools and DPD, uh, calling for more counselors, not cops. It can also lead to things like further investigation, as you can see of the BRIC and game database. So I just wanted to ground us on, obviously there are many levels for us to, to start working at, but this is where we're starting. And yeah, glad to have you all with us. MOU, MOA, Memorandum of Agreement or a Memorandum of Understanding. It's just an agreement dictating the relationship that's supposed to be uh, between the Boston School Police and the Boston Police Department. It's very old, it's from 1996, so we're working on getting that updated and up to par with the MA legislature. <laughs> Um, so in this slide, we just want to give you a visual of how student information can be shared um, and how this can happen, you know, even in a school context where student records are supposed to be protected. Um, you know, there's federal legislation around that, yet this information is being shared. So what happens is something occurs at a school um, and as Valeria was um, you know, describing before, the thing that happens can be very minor. It doesn't have to be anything dramatic um, happening. In fact, it could even just be an observation of student behavior um, that is not any infraction whatsoever, right? So students could be hanging out together, which is, you know, what kids do in school. Well, not during COVID, but you know what I mean? Um, you know, they hang out together and, you know, if a police officer deems that suspicious, they could record that. So any information about um, a student that they're observing or if an incident occurs, the BSP, it's written there on the slide, which is the Boston School Police Officer um, in the building can write a report. Um, and there's actually a few different kinds of reports that Boston School Police write. That's why there's sort of two arrows coming out of that. One arrow goes through the Boston Public Schools central office um, before it is then sent or could be sent um, to the Boston Police Department. Um, and there's very minimal oversight um, at the central office level of the reports that are going through the central office. Um, so prior to January of this year, there was only one individual who was the chief of the school police who was um, reviewing those documents as they were coming through. Since January, there's been, um, because of the advocacy of the folks on this call and many, uh, even some folks in, in attending today who, you know, testified at school committee um, and the press um, that covers that we've seen, the district did add another individual to be part of the review process. Um, and that is either the superintendent herself or a designee. Um, largely, we imagine it is the designee. Um, and so in theory, those people would be looking at the reports before sending them to the BPD. Um, but right now, there's no policy governing what kinds of reports can be shared and what kinds of reports can't be shared. So then that begs the question of, well, what exactly is happening in this review process if there's no protocol guiding that? Um, you can also see that there's an arrow that goes over, right, arches over, um, where it says Boston uh, Public School Central Office. And that's because there's some reports that Boston School Police can write and do write um, that actually do not have to go through the current existing um, protocols or lack of protocols, um, they don't have to go through central office. They can be directly submitted to the BPD system without any oversight at all at the BPS level. So whether it's through minimal oversight through central office or no oversight at all, um, some reports get to the Boston Police Department. And um, 
once they're there, um, because of all the intricacies of the interconnectedness of the law enforcement institutions um, that Valeria and Fatima were talking about, um, the Boston Police Department's information or the information that they hold um, can be shared with the Boston Regional Intelligence Center, the BRIC. Um, and it's through the BRIC then that the FBI or um, ICE um, can access information, right? Access those incident reports that say things about students like so and so and so and so we're talking in the hall. But if so and so number two is somehow deemed suspicious, right, or labeled to be a gang member, then that incident report or that observation report has a lot of meaning and it's very high stakes um, for the young people involved. Um, and the other, you know, issue there. Um, of course, is that the, the gang database is managed by the BRIC. Um, and so that's how some of that information additionally gets shared among these institutions um, and gets legitimized by these institutions and then weaponized um, for incarceration, deportation, harassment, et cetera. So I think we can go to the next slide. Um, and Nora's gonna talk a bit about this. So um, in section five of the ordinance, um, there is, um, so it outlines um, clear policy for how Boston school police can share um, information with the Boston Police Department. Um, and we have four pillars to this, uh, to this part of the policy. The first is that we, we think that there should be clear criteria for when a school police officer can write um, an incident, incident report. Um, and, and that should only be cases that are extreme and mandated by law. So for us, those are um, um, serious bodily harm. So not just like I push Lena and you know she stumbles, but it has to be serious bodily harm. Um, and that's not to say that if people are pushing each other, there shouldn't be consequences, but as educators, I know that like those consequences should happen inside the school with um, an educated lens um, and not through criminalizing students. Um, the second is a true and credible threat, which means that they have to have both the motive, the means and the motive. So it can't just be someone mouthing off, but a real threat to um, this um, that could be dangerous. Um, the third is a firearm and that is required by Massachusetts law. And the fourth is um, drugs that are not um, alcohol, nicotine, or marijuana because those have been decriminalized for youth. Um, and so then the second pillar of the, of the protocol is transparency and communication. Um, so right now, if an incident report is written about a student, students do not know that this has happened. Um, and their families do not know. And so we um, believe that students and families should be informed and there should be a conversation um, and there should be a translator if needed be and there should be access to legal counsel um, and as well as other frameworks that we've modeled off of suspension hearings. So we believe that if something is um, deserving of a a police report is at so extreme that it necess necessitates an Police report that there sh it should go through the same process as suspension, but also have legal counsel um, and a translator. The oh, sorry, uh, a couple more things on that slide. I'm going to go back to that one. Okay, um, so the other two components um, of this section of the ordinance are around oversight and accountability and training. Um, so as I was explaining before um, on the, um, the slide with the, um, the sort of flow chart, there's so little oversight. And so this um, ordinance would change that. It would require oversight at the school level um, first, at the district level, um, and it would uh, mandate the formation of a community information sharing oversight board. Um, so there'd be community level oversight as well. Um, and so after information, after reports had been shared um, with the police department, um, the community would get uh, a 
list of these reports so that we would be able to identify with student information redacted and we'll be able to identify if there were any trends um, that we were seeing you know in terms of racial disparities for example um, in the in the reports um, and we would also then mandate um, training, of course, for Boston School Police and any other relevant staff, including school administrators. Um, because obviously without, um, you know, without training uh, folks on what this, this new stuff does, then it doesn't get done. So um, that's the last sort of pillar of this section. The other piece that we wanted to make sure that we mention um, is that um, this policy, this ordinance specifically prohibits Boston School Police from sharing um, certain kinds of information about students in the reports that they write. So even for the reports that are permitted, um, the ones that Nora was outlining before, um, you know, bodily harm, serious bodily harm, et cetera, even in those reports, they would not be able to share information about student nationality, immigration status, spoken language, religion, um, their neighborhood, any, you know, assumptions around suspected gang affiliation, which is very important, um, and other non-criminal information um, with, the, with the Boston Police Department. Um, and this piece around suspected gang affiliation is, is really important um, because it is through this labeling of students as gang affiliated or gang associated that young people are entered into the gang database. Um, and once they have been deemed, um, you know, officially by the, the police as um, a bona fide gang member um, or even just gang associated, um, then in terms of the deportation, uh, you know, the, their prospects, um, it becomes very difficult um, because in immigration court, um, the accusation of being a gang member um, carries a lot of weight, even if that accusation comes with no evidence whatsoever, um, which is the case for, you know, many of the young people that we're talking about um, in this in this situation. Um, and the policy, the, the ordinance specifically bans sharing information um, with the Boston Regional Intelligence Center with the BRIC. Um, so just to kind of go back to that diagram that Lena showed at the beginning, what we see that the point of this um, policy is, um, I think click one more time, is to really stop the information flow before it goes to the Boston Police Department. Um, and we know that once it goes to the Boston Police Department, there's so much sharing with federal law enforcement and the gang database is so um, harmful that we want to really create a policy that safeguards um, student information um, before it can go to the Boston Police Department um, and really kind of allow students to make the mistakes that every student should allow, be allowed to make as they are growing up and learning um, because we know that part of learning is making those mistakes and we don't want those mistakes to lead to the criminalizing of students. Basically uh, the ordinance this is the timeline and the ordinances were already introduced uh, then the next step is the assignment to committees uh, which the face uh, surveillance ban was, was assigned to committee. Uh, then we have the hearing and then in the hearing is where we need your support. We need you to, uh, I, I will explain more later, but we need to testify, present written testimony. After the hearing, they started working meetings to discuss possible amendments, language modifications. Uh, then comes the vote by the council. Then the Mayor, the mayor has to sign it, we hope he will, if it passes, and then we can all organize a victory party, hopefully uh, be a Zoom, because it will be soon. <laughs> so, so this is basically the basic timeline uh, of how ordinances move through the city council. And uh, here comes the exciting part, which is how you can contribute. So Matt, if you can, yes, there it goes. So the ways for you to get involved. Uh, first of all, write testimony in support of the ordinances and turn, uh, send us uh, those testimonies. We are gathering testimonies. Uh, for now, we are gathering written testimonies for face surveillance ban, the ordinance. Uh, we will also soon have a template testimony for the uh, information sharing uh, and surveillance ordinance. Uh, I think that we are going to send you 
those after when we follow up after this this webinar but this is basic testimony template you can reach out to me if you have any doubt uh, I will Matt will send you my email so it's a basic testimony template which is like you have to choose certain arguments that we came up with and you should like write uh, where are you from what's your interest uh, why are you interested in 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 this phase in the in the phase of readiness plan and, and then in the in the surveillance oversight uh, ordinance we are also inviting you to testify at the virtual hearing that's exciting because now that will be through Zoom. And so um, that's more e that's easier for you maybe to testify than to go to a city council. So so stay, uh, we will stay in touch and we will uh, come back to you with the details. Uh, this is also a very important thing that you can do is to call or email your city councillors uh, to say that you support the ordinances and you should also reach out to your network uh, so that everyone can call their city councillors, uh, so that they feel the pressure uh, of passing these ordinances, because these ordinances are are important. Another way you can you can help and you can involve is to promote on social media. If you have Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, you can just uh, spread the voice uh, so that people become aware of these issues, because most people are really not aware of this. Um, uh, finally, you should watch your email for information of the writing testimony, as I told you, calling the counselors and the coming hearings, um, put your email address uh, and also uh, which actions you are committing to do in the chat. Uh, Matt will follow up with more details, including a sample script for phone calls if you want to make phone calls, sample emails and more. So you don't have to do all of them. You can cherry pick one or you can do all of them if you want to help us. It will be great. Uh, so this is basically all. Thank you for joining us. And now the Q&A. Uh, I see that we have uh, two questions. The first one by Ingrid Skoog. Is that the way it's pronounced? Uh, that's, I think that's from me because this is, is this just for facial surveillance or all surveillance like heartbeat, gait analysis, etc.? Well, that's a really good question. This ban is only for face surveillance. It's only for the identification made through automated or semi-automated processes using the facial features of our face. Uh, but yes, that, that's that. What the other things you mentioned is part of biometric recognition, which is also which is as you may know, uh, there is a bill now on the on the state legislature on Beacon Hill, uh, which deals with the face recognition and with other types of biometric recognition, like for example, guide analysis. As to an actual time frame uh, for the timeline, do you uh, do want do folks want me to answer this or? Yeah, I think it makes sense for us to maybe give a timeline because there was some questions involving the BPS and school committee. So in terms of timeline for the BPS level work, um, BPS currently has CAVE thanks to our communities organizing and they have agreed to create a working group with us. Unfortunately, they've only given us a one, one month time frame that they want to accomplish this and they are bringing their own partners on board. So, you know, while it seems that the policy will be introduced now in the end of August, it could be that this is a very different policy from what we want and we need to be able to be ready to organize. So that's just an update at the BPS level. Um, do you, Emiliano, do you want to give an update on the phase span and the- yeah. Yes, so this is not confirmed yet. Uh, but we think that the uh, hearing for face surveillance will be on June 9. So, so this don't uh, this is not confirmed publicly. Yes, but that's that's what we heard. So, so if you can prepare uh, in with that um, a date in your mind, uh, that would be great. If I could just speak to um, a comment from Mike. Mike, you said you recommend a petition campaign, and we are right there with you. We're gonna. Uh, have an email going out to our full list next week asking folks to sign a petition and I'll get that to you folks as well. Karina asking, can you explain how the face surveillance is very dangerous when it comes to criminalizing people of color through these, through these different surveillance technologies? Yes, I, I think we'll take that, yes. Well, actually, this technology is a big threat to civil rights and civil liberties and it's especially dangerous uh, when it works and when it doesn't work. And it is especially dangerous for women of color, 
for example, uh, MIT, um, the MIT research from the MIT have found that these systems, this technology misidentifies uh, darker uh, black women in a ratio of one to three. So, so this is very dangerous. Uh, it's, it's another, another, for example, another research which, uh, which deals with uh, emotional recognition, which is also a type of facial recognition system, showed uh, that it took a, uh, the photos of the NBA where all the players were smiling and the system said that the black men were uh, angry and contemptuous while the white, my, the, the, the white counterparts were just like happy. So as you can see, these systems are very, very biased uh, against people of color. So that's, an, and on top of this, they are going to be used to police and to over police communities of color. So, so that's why we are trying to, to ban its use from the, from the police department mainly. Thanks, Emiliana. We have another question. Are we targeting a certain counselors? Can the mayor veto and how likely is that? Is there some sort of legal problem or oppositionary challenge to the prohibition on info sharing? I almost uh, feel like we can all answer different parts of this question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, you know, I, I'll just, I'll, t I'll touch base a little bit about, I think from the landscape side, um, you know, this issue is definitely something, at least the stuff at the BPS level is definitely something that I think the mayor definitely would, had hoped that it would be dealt at at the school level and not get to the city level. Um, you know, our mayor does talk about how he's very immigrant friendly, how he does support immigrants and he is looking to protect immigrants and young people and people of color. So I think um, it would be it would be interesting for us to see what the response of the mayor will be, but I, but it most likely he would want to show support towards these kind of things. But again, I think the biggest pushback will be from the Boston Police Department. Um, and we've already seen how they even have had a huge sway in conversations, just outside conversations with the PPS administrators in influencing whether they adopt our policy or not. So I think that's important to note. Um, thank you, Valeria. And as to the certain counselors that we are targeting, we are, you should reach out to, we are targeting all of them because we want this uh, ordinance to pass unanimously. We did that before in, in some cities and towns where this ordinance, ordinance is usually passed unanimously. So we are hoping that the city of Boston is the same. And as to the mayor veto question, uh, well, yes, the mayor, the, the mayor can veto whatever he wants. Uh, how likely is, I, I, I don't know, I can't answer. Uh, but hopefully he won't, uh, because there will be a unanimous decision and well, hopefully he will be discouraged from vetoing these ordinances. And I don't know if I understand the question about the legal problems uh, or oppositionary challenge to the prohibition of info sharing what you're referring to? I, it seems to me the question is, if we prohibit info sharing, is that going to face a legal challenge? Is it legal for us to prohibit the info sharing between these agencies with a local ordinance? Thank you, Matt. Well, actually, it, it is legal because uh, the only thing that the city of Boston is doing, I mean, the city council is doing is, is regulating, regulating things that happen in the city of Boston, where city agencies are involved. So the city council has authority to do these things. So uh, I don't know maybe what kind of legal problem uh, that uh, Zachary was thinking about, but as to the authority that the city council has, the city council has, has authority. Uh, it's not that this information sharing will reach uh, the FBI or the DA or any other federal agency that is currently working in the city of Boston. It's only targeting the city of Boston agencies. Uh, so hopefully that solves the question. I would just add from the BPS side, or from you know from the the, the school issue. Um, you know, there's there's no state law. There's no law that mandates um, you know the presence of police officers or school police or school resource officers, whatever term is used um, in, in schools. Um, and there's no, you know, there's no 
um, law around what specifically needs to be shared apart from some select cases. Um, and those were taken to a account when we wrote um, section five of the ordinance, um, which allows for the school police officers to share certain information. Um, and so that was in, in accordance with the existing Massachusetts general law. Um, so that's just to add that. I, I mean, we, went, we wouldn't foresee a, a legal challenge on, on that front. And also, Matt, I saw there is a question in the chat from yes that's what i was thinking and before we answer our l's uh question which is very timely and relevant to current events we have a question um from 1k2 zvg um who says thank you so we appreciate that thanks we've got a lot of puzzles <laughs> on top of it, so thank you to everyone who attended and this person's asking interested in your thoughts about two things what about the potential of information sharing between colleges or universities and the Boston Police Department? Does that need to be addressed? What about trying to get the ordinance enacted on a state level? Any possibility of action on that front? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we've, oh, sorry, Boy, do you wanna talk? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to remind folks of the, the small diagram we were showing, how like we see these efforts at, as baby steps to actually starting to build a broad base of supporters and community members who will help us to actually win some of these larger fights that does require, like when you're fighting something at the, at the state level does require a, a big base and, and a lot of support. Um, and just, I was just going to say that in terms of like, it's interesting to think about space surveillance at the, in the college context. I think it's just one quick interesting fact that you might also want to connect to this is just that fact that, for example, places like UMass Boston ha doesn't have a holding cell. So if, um, if someone were to get into a predicament of some sort, let's say that person, you know, is an impacted person, is at risk of being um, criminalized further because of this incident, they actually get taken to a county jail instead of um, having a holding cell in their own uh, campus. And that is an issue. And so I think those are also things that I know technology is very important, but also there's already physical ways in which these collaborations happen at these levels that we should think about as well. Um, I'll let someone else answer the face one, but I just thought it was an interesting connect thing to connect to this question. Yeah, I mean, I would also add in terms of like sharing information between college campuses and the BPD, I am confident that that happens. I think we started in this place both because we were teachers and students and and because um, the school district is under is a city department um, and therefore the ordinance can better gov you know city council can better govern the school committee and it gets more complicated but if you work at a university i really encourage you to ask questions and you know start asking for more information because we started this work by just asking a lot of questions to try to understand the landscape and then thinking about how these rules could what a, what an ordinance could look like or policy could look like i guess not to mention too just the fact that there are agreements standing um, where campuses do have ice or other law enforcement come and do presentations which can be really awkward, especially when you bring ICE to present maybe to a classroom that has undocumented or immigrant students or the FBI. Um, and they also have um, contracts where students can go and actually do uh, research or whatever type of work, uh, internship with some of these agencies. Uh, yes, and I'm going to, thank you. That was, that's so interesting. I uh, hope that answers the first part of the question. And as to the second part, yes, actually, we have a bill. Uh, we are supporting a bill uh, on the state legislature that would uh, provide for a moratorium on the use of face recognition statewide in all city state agencies until there are mechanisms by which civil rights, civil liberties, and these inaccuracies can be uh, mitigated. So we are trying to get that passed. If you want to contact your, your state rep or, or your state senator, you are welcome to that, of course. Uh, so yes, we're working hard uh, to pass that, uh, that bill uh, by the end of the session. So hopefully, I don't know, maybe that would happen. So 
Thank you for asking. So great. Oh, yeah, uh, so the... yes, Mike. Sorry, not a, Mike. H wants to just follow up. If we can send it for the state legislature, uh, yes. So I will copy the link to the state legislature, so you can have it here. Um, so I will do that now. Great. Um, and then I was going to put in that link about the state legislation. And again, I'm going to send you tomorrow a follow-up that has a bunch of resources. So if you RSVP um, online on the ACLU website to this event, you'll definitely get that. So if you're not sure if you did or you didn't, please put your email in the chat because it will include information about the names of these ordinances um, and a lot of links for further learning. For instance, our Director of Privacy and Technology actually did a TEDx talk on this issue not long ago. In that follow-up is going to be a link to her TEDx talk, which is really awesome. Um, so that brings us to RL's question. I follow South Korean news closely, and technology, including face recognition and mapping, has been very helpful in tracking and containing COVID. So do you see any way that face recognition can be part of a public safety in Metro Boston if and when issues of profiling, accuracy, and malfeasance are addressed systemically? Uh, well, thank you, Errol, for the question. Uh, a couple of things about the quest this question. First, it is important to understand that this technology is bad when it works and when it doesn't work. So uh, the inaccuracies may be solved, but it, but it will be very bad if it is used, even if it's accurate. So this is an important thing. So it's bad when it works and when it doesn't work. And as to the South Korean thing that you, the case that you mentioned, I would I'm a little bit skeptical of the news reporting. I will take everything that I read with a grain of salt. Uh, I have not read uh, that face recognition was actively used by the South Korean government. There were other digital technologies involved, not specifically uh, face recognition. But we also have to understand that these countries like South Korea, China, Russia, that is used in China and Russia and are using effectively face recognition, they already had the infrastructure for face recognition before this COVID crisis. In this country, that infrastructure does not exist. So proposing this kind of solutions that worked in other places and just like transplanting them uh, would not work because we don't have the, infra the surveillance infrastructure. Uh, luckily, in this country, there is no surveillance infrastructure to, to, to deploy face recognition to identify uh, COVID positive people or to enforce quarantines. So I would say that uh, take all this news with a grain of salt uh, because we won't like new infrastructure, new surveillance infra infrastructure in this moment where resources should be used to feed people, to provide housing to people, to provide a, a, a money to people that lost their paychecks. So so that's my take on, on the use of the technolo this technology and others uh, to contain COVID-19. Um, I just want to address um, a point that a few people brought up that they're interested in emailing or maybe even testifying, but they don't live in Boston. So I'll follow up with you about that, provided I have your email address. Um, our feeling is that we want to, you know, Boston residents as constituents of these city councilors will have the, the biggest effect. So that's our focus. But if you don't live in Boston, but can make a connection to Boston, perhaps you work there. Um, or you have family there, so you travel through the city and you might be subject to being profiled by this uh, technology or otherwise impacted it. I think there is, it, it is there for, uh, it is helpful for you to weigh in if you can make that connection. So that's something to think about and then we can discuss that more as we, um, as we follow up. Um, and let's see if any other questions come up. And Deb, um, you just, we're asking for the names of, of the bills. Um, Emiliano sent the state level bill. What we're working on the city level is two ordinances, community control for police surveillance and the face surveillance ban. Um, but I think the face surveillance ban formal name is a little bit different. Um, yeah. Yes, Mark, I, I think that they were asking for the state level, which is, the name is an act establishing a moratorium on face recognition and other remote biometric surveillance systems. I think they were asking for that email, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's right. I, I actually misunderstood. So Deb, Emiliano did send that link in the chat. Uh, but again, when I send the follow-up, provided I have your email, is going to include a landing page to a bunch of... Uh... Oh, you know what, Emiliano? You're sending it to, the, to all panelists. So change your... Um... 
settings to send that to panel. Oh, to sorry. <laughs> so Amelia sorry, Adams sorry. keeps sending that to us. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, so we'll get that taken Sorry about that. <laughs> um, uh, but there, again, there's tons of resources like uh, on our website that I'm going to send you that, that, that go into the details of the bill, the background, what it's meant to do, the TED Talk and all that stuff. Here's another question. Has BPD itself issued statements or otherwise weighed in about either proposed ordinance? I don't know if they have said anything yet publicly about the face ban and the surveillance oversight. However, um, we did initially this work started back in 2008. Some of this work started back in 2018 and there was a hearing just to kind of engage what the city councilors thought about the idea of a surveillance oversight ordinance and um, Commissioner Gross at the time was there. Um, and so one of the things that, you know, is constantly brought up is this idea that you know, this technology is used to victims of violence to, to get to gain justice for their families. And, you know, there's actually very few from what we know, and I think, you know, Emiliano and Matt and others um, can speak more on this, but as far as research, there's very little research to show, you know, how effective the gang database is, how effective Brick is, um, how effective the technology actually is in capturing whoever it is that committed a crime. Um, and so it's really important for us to some, combat these stories with our own stories about instances where these things didn't help us. Um, but yeah, and, this, and similar comments were made in regards to our policy as well, to the VPS policy, um, but yeah. And as to the face surveillance, well, actually uh, it was last week, it was like the budget, uh, the police budget was being discussed in the city council and Commissioner Ross, uh, which is the chief police, mentioned that they were not interested in the, in the, in the technology, uh, that they wouldn't go, uh, they wouldn't acquire technology without the city council approval. Uh, so this is good. So hopefully this will translate into them uh, not opposing this ban uh on face surveillance so so yes that's that's what commissioner ross said uh that they're not interested in the technology because in his words the technology is not there yet uh we think that the technology will never be there <laughs> so but this is a good start so so thank you for the question it's a really good question go ahead Emiliano, if you were gonna address that question from bonnie will you include a link that outlines the racial bias studies you have discovered with facial recognition uh, yes, yes, we are going to uh, send a bunch of material where w there is especially one one pager about the racial bias uh, of this technology. So yes, we're going to send that. If not, you can always reach me out and I can provide you with any research that you are interested in. We do appreciate all these warm words. Uh, thank you, Colin. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, everyone who said that you appreciated the information we provided today. Thank you, Patrick. Um, but the key of this is, is it's got to, you know, we need follow up. We need to follow up with you and we need folks to take action and reach out to the city council or, or ask a friend who lives in Boston to reach out to the city council. Um, otherwise, this is, this is not going to go through. Um, may seem like a common sense reform to us, but we do expect opposition from different uh, areas of law enforcement. And that's what's happened to the towns where we did pass this. Um, there was, there was often a, uh, loud opposition from law enforcement, and we had to mobilize as a community to, to push this through. So I look forward to staying in touch with all of you uh, as this campaign moves forward. Um, next week is gonna be our big week of action because we do expect that hearing on, on face surveillance to come up very soon. And we'll let you know as soon as we have a concrete date for that. So unless any of our panelists have any, any final words, I'm gonna go back to the slide with my contact information. Um, and I'll also stay online for a few more minutes in case anyone hasn't had a chance to put their email in the chat yet. All right. Well, thank you all for attending and uh, excited to be working with everyone on this campaign over the next several weeks. Bye bye everyone. Panelists, you can go ahead and, and sign off and I'm gonna stay on here and remain together that chat.